Welcome back, guys. I'm Dennis Neal. Now we're going to talk to Ramesh Paduru. He is a Bloomberg View columnist. He's senior editor at the National Review, and he's been uh, torching it up late with a couple of interesting topics. Thanks for being with you, Ramesh. And why don't we start first with the column he wrote a few days ago. Headline is Hillary Clinton too old for the White House. So first, start with a yes or no answer. Is she? Uh, I don't think she's too old for the White House, but I think her age is going to be a factor, and it's uh, it's going to be a problem for her to deal with. Yes, you actually point out that you would not let it stop you from voting for Hillary Clinton if you were a Hillary supporter. She turned. She will be 69 years old on Election Day, and you point out that you had voted for McCain in 08, who was older at the time, 72. That's right. You know, I think there are a lot of other factors that uh, you've got away when making these decisions. Um, but I think there is a tendency for um, people who support uh, a candidate with this problem to say, oh, it's just so unfair. You know, this shouldn't be an issue. And well, it is an issue. Well, here's the thing that's going to really tick me off, Ramesh, is if for the entire two-year presidential campaign, are we never allowed to ask questions about Hillary Clinton's suitability because she's a woman? I seem to remember in 1980 in the Re Ronald Reagan election, all kinds of questions all the time about how old he was. I can't remember if he was over age 70 when he took office or not. Can you? He was, uh, if I remember correctly, he was 68. He, um, in, in the first election and uh, in 72 in the second one, you know, age was an issue for Reagan. Age was an issue for Bob Dole in 1996, running against Hillary's husband. Uh, age was an issue for John McCain, running against Obama in 2008. And the evidence suggests that voters do put some weight on it, and it does hurt. Um, and, and in particular, um, it, it, I suspect it hurts more if there are some serious health issues. Um, and that's one reason why people are going to be asking those questions about her. Yes, Karl Rove and the conservatives have done a, a deft job of bringing up those, those health issues regarding uh, Secretary Clinton. I guess that's what we call her now. Um, do you think it's inherently sexist when opponents or critics or, or, or pundits begin to worry about Hillary Clinton's age? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I don't because it's been raised and appropriately raised in the case of McCain and Dole and Reagan. Um, you know, but the other thing is, uh, it doesn't really, some of it doesn't even have to be raised. The voters are going to just take a look, see if somebody seems vigorous and in command, and make their own judgments. Now, the health questions, um, it may take some pushing by opposition figures, not necessarily an opposing candidate, but other opponents, to make some of that information go public so that people can evaluate it. But once, but with, when the information is available and public, Voters can be trusted, I think, to make their own judgments. You bring up some interesting math here. You point out that Americans have not often re reached back a generation to choose a president. They've chosen a president more than five years older than the previous president only four times in American history. And, you know, especially lately, Ramesh, it feels like the American public really likes a young, dynamic president. I think Clinton was kind of the first one. I remember in his first election, the election party, they played uh, Fleetwood Mac, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Never mind that it was a song from the late 70s. I mean, that to me was a, a total generational shift. And then we got George W. Bush, who was kind of a young man. And then Obama, who I believe is one of the youngest uh, presidents ever to be elected. And so this age factor, especially given the recent youth in the White House, could actually be a bigger issue. Do you think it actually could hurt Hillary Clinton's chances of winning the, the, the election if she wins the yeah, Democratic been, nomination? There is often a kind of torch passing aspect to presidential elections, as in the 1992 election, from the World War II generation of George H.W. Bush to the baby boomers. Uh, and it is a I think a little bit odd to pass the torch backward. Yes. Now, here's the thing, though. Given that the baby boom generation is is swelling, given that that it's one of the biggest uh, 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 piglets in the python in terms of age ranges, might the elderly people who are over age 70, let's say, like the idea of electing an older president, a president who's 69 on election day? Or you know, that's one of the interesting things I found out when I was uh, researching this column. You would think that, uh, and you would think that maybe older voters would resent this um, idea that somebody who is older right. might not be able to do the job. But in fact, 
um, where there was some detailed work done in 1996 when this question got raised about Bob Dole, the voters who were most likely to be worried about Dole's age were themselves older voters. That's so the interesting. evidence is people do seem to people who are older and notice that the, the problems they themselves are having with getting older do tend to worry more about it uh, and whether these people are up for the White House. You know, that, that, that it sounds uh, hilariously self-loathing, but I, I guess people who are older, over age 70, know just what hell it is being over age 70. And so they feel like, well, heck, I wouldn't want to have to be running the country. And so they actually see it from a much more personal standpoint. And it is, of course, I mean, it is a remarkably taxing job. I mean, we've all seen the way uh, the job seems to age uh, its true. holders. That's true. You look at President Obama, and boy, maybe uh, unless he stopped using Grecian Formula 16, boy, did he start going gray in that White House. Well, let's move on to another recent column of yours, you know, like to rip and read here. Um, sure. The path to conservative reform. What do conservatives need to do, and what is that path? Well, I think that conservatives uh, have had uh, the right principles. I'm a conservative myself, uh, but I think we have not done a great job in recent years of showing how we can apply those principles in ways that will make a positive difference to people's lives today. And that, I think, is the essential political task in front of conservatives. We need to do that in order to show that our principles aren't just sort of sound in some philosophical sense, but will actually do good for the middle class and things like health care or energy or, or making higher education more affordable. That, I think, is, is the key challenge for conservatives right now. Ramesh, uh, one disconnect, and I'm not a political expert by any means, but it seems one disconnect is that in national politics now, the parties have become so polarized, you're either all liberal or you're all conservative. But I wonder how many Americans really are like that. Many of us are jackafants. We're part Democratic jackass, right. part Republican elephant. I'm very much a fiscal conservative. I believe business good, government bad. I believe government messes stuff up. It spends too much. But I don't want, which a lot of conservatives want, government coming in my bedroom and telling what I can do, government going into the doctor's office and telling a woman what she can do. So I'm a little liberal on some things or, or libertarian and conservative on others. Yet you guys in the political spectrum there, it's all binary. It's one right. or the other. Can't someone come along and kind of skate between that dividing line and get a little from each side? You know, and uh, and just to add to your point, there are also a lot of voters out there who are, who are with the Democrats on some of the economic issues. They want a higher minimum wage. They think the government should play a big role in health care. Uh, but at the same time, they are pro-life. Um, so the problem is, you know, there are 330 million people in our country, and there are only two main political parties. Uh, and so nobody, not many people are going to line up perfectly with one or the other. I think that part of the problem that we have with those two polarized parties, as you're talking about, is that neither of those parties is really addressing the concerns of most people or talking about Bingo. talking to people in ways that they can relate to. Republicans often talk to people as though they all want to start a business. They're all entrepreneurs. Democrats often talk to people as though they're all victims who need rescuing by the federal government. And I yes. think. But the party that starts talking to people as people who have their own goals and aspirations and sometimes need help but are perfectly capable of mapping out their own destinies, I think that party is uh, is going to succeed. Well, for Republicans, it seems like the, the biggest problem is, is that to get the nomination of your party, you have to be so ardently conservative and so all the way over to the far, far right that you then have a tougher time getting elected by the general population once you get the nomination of the party. What do you say? You know, um, I think that uh, it's a mistake to think about what's gone wrong with Republicans in terms of sort of one part of the party. Well, it's the problem is the far right of the party. The problem is the establishment. I think the whole party through and through um, across the spectrum has been a little disconnected from the economic struggles that most people are going through. And I think that's what needs to be addressed. And then, you know, people are going to continue to have their disagreements about, uh, about you know, who's more conservative than who or how just how conservative we should be. But we ought to be focusing on this question of how do we improve middle class standards of living?
Right, I see what you're saying there. Okay, thank you very much for being with us, Ramesh. Uh, some pretty good points here, and I'll tell you, they could, the Republican Party could use more thinking like this. Uh, we appreciate it very much, and we appreciate your time, and good day, Thanks you, sir. Thanks so much. Okay. All right, folks, we're going to be coming right back. We've got, uh, we've got the panel coming up, I think. We've got the five, the best of the five right here with the, the Steve Malsberg show uh, coming up. And uh, we've got more topics to discuss. You've got to stick around with us, otherwise you're going to miss out. Um, and we'll be back soon. And I am Dennis Neal subbing for Steve Malsberg. I'm a longtime journalist, six years as a TV guy. Having an awful lot of fun here, though, I'll tell you that. Stick with us. We'll be right back.